Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Kay McCall and I'm the Executive Director of the Renewable Energy Alliance Houston. We're an organization that is working to empower Houston to lead in the energy transition. Today, we are very pleased to feature two CEOs who are leaders in the energy storage industry and who have been working to build their businesses in Houston. We have another panelist who is an expert in developing and financing energy storage and other renewable energy projects. Well, let's get started. First, I'm pleased to introduce Jeff Bishop. Jeff is a clean energy entrepreneur and a leader in the US energy transition, focusing on the intersection of finance, commercial technology and policy. Jeff is a CEO and founder of Key Capture Energy, one of America's largest owner operators of standalone battery storage projects. Prior to founding Key Capture Energy, Jeff held senior positions at Brookfield Renewable and EDP Renewables, two of the largest renewable energy companies in the United States, where he was responsible for financial analysis, corporate development, and market design. Jeff got his start in renewable energy working for a wind energy developer in Morocco in 2002. Jeff holds an MBA from Chicago Booth and a BS in electrical and computer engineering from Rice University. He is currently on leave from his MS in electrical engineering at the University of Utah. Jeff spent a year researching renewable energy failures in Uganda and Botswana from 2004 to 2005 and was a Forbes 30 under 30 energy award winner in 2011. Jeff describes himself as a mediocre skier and a tenacial, tenacious bicycle commuter and includes in his public transportation advocacy a previous board membership at Bike Houston. Jeff and his partner Boyu live in Salt Lake City, Utah. Jeff is active in the broader LGBT equality movement and he served on the board for the Montrose Center, a nonprofit empowering Houston's LGBT community and co-chaired the Rice University LGBT Alumni Association. Welcome, Jeff. Next, we have Steve Vavrick. Steve is CEO and managing partner with Broadreach Power. S Steve has spent two decades developing and managing power and energy projects. Prior to his time at Broadreach Power, Steve worked developing, trading, and managing energy investments with some of the leading companies in the industry, including GE, Enron, First Wind, Sun Power, and Apex Clean Energy. At these companies, Steve was directly involved in over $4 billion worth of investments in operating wind and solar power projects. Steve earned a BS and MS in mechanical engineering from the University of Illinois, a master's in public administration from Princeton, and a JD from Yale Law School. An avid reader, Steve usually has two books going at a time. Recently, that's included The Second Mountain by David Brooks and Where the Crawdads Sing, Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens. Thank you, Steve, for being here. Next, we have Rohit Sanchdev, a, a lawyer with Oric. Rohit is a partner at Oric in its San Francisco office and a member of the firm's energy and infrastructure practice. His practice focuses on the development, purchase, sale, and financing of renewables and energy storage facilities, representing many of the world's leading developers of solar, wind, energy storage, biofuel, and gas projects. He has worked on tens of thousands of megawatts of power purchase agreements, EPC contracts, and sales of renewable energy companies. Actively involved in energy storage since 23, Wohith has developed has helped clients develop thousands of megawatts of battery and other energy storage facilities, including both standalone and hybrid facilities. When he's not supporting the energy transition, he spends his time with his wife and two kids sailing in the San Francisco Bay and playing his guitar. Last but not least, we have Chris Meshack. Chris is a director at Pickering Energy Partners. Previously, Chris was a vice president at Huntington Ventures, a midstream private equity sponsor focused on all forms of energy storage. Before that, Chris was a senior analyst at Bentec Energy, a boutique energy consulting and analytics firm. Chris has also held trading and analytical positions at investment banks and hedge funds in New York, Connecticut, and Hong Kong. He received a BA in economics and Asian studies and graduated magna cum laude with honors from Colgate. Chris speaks Mandarin Chinese and is a former chef. Chris, take it away. 
Thanks, Kay. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, for joining today. I, I was on a panel recently on uh, the state of private equity in oil and gas, and I think we had 20 or 30 uh, participants in that panel. And uh, it looks like we have almost 215 here uh, participating today. So I think that really speaks to uh, the popularity and the trend and, and all the energy that's, that's focused on, uh, no pun intended, energy storage today. Uh, so I want to just hand it over to, to the panelists here to just give a little, a little bit of additional information. Um, if there's anything else that, that uh, you want to say about yourself or uh, a little bit of background on, on your firm and where you're focused, um, Rohit, if you want to take it away, we, we'll start with you. Chris, thanks. Uh, I'll keep it short. I know Kay already gave very helpful introductions. Um, yeah, for those who don't know me, I'm Rohit Sashtab in San Francisco, uh, partner at Auric. Uh, our practice focuses on a range of renewables and other um, generation technologies, development and financing. Uh, we've been doing uh, storage since uh, 2013, uh, everything from offtakes to uh, every other you know, form of development, EPC, procurement, uh, all the way down to financing and M&A now. And it's just been a very robust and exciting ride. So I'll hand it over to, uh, to Steve. Thanks, Charlotte. Yeah, Steve Averick with Broadreach Power. Uh, we're an independent power producer that's focused on storage. Uh, based in Houston, we've got 34 employees and 24 of them are in Houston. We've got projects in Texas, California, and the Pacific Northwest, a uh, combination of standalone storage and some solar wind and storage. Uh, we see applications for storage, especially lithium ion cells, like really across the whole energy market. And we think that's growing. So happy to be here and looking forward to talking more, talking to you more about it. Great. And, uh, and we can hand it over to Jeff um, for a little bit of background. And, and I think uh, we're going to hit right here at the front. Why storage uh, and why now? No, definitely appreciate that. So uh, Jeff Bishop, uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, Key Capture Energy. And uh, if you want to hit that next slide. So uh, we're a 45 person company. Uh, we got about 20 up in New York, about 10, maybe 15 uh, down in Houston. And then uh, we have 30 megawatts in operations in Texas today and 200 megawatts currently under construction. And so uh, we develop, construct, own and operate energy storage projects. And uh, I'm sure we'll be getting you know, really aggressively into how are our energy storage IPPs different than uh, you know the wind and solar companies of you know 10, 12 years ago, and uh, what exactly you know we, we have in common? But first, just a table set to make sure that you know we're we're all on the same page on this. If you want to hit the next slide, uh, it becomes a fundamental question of why storage now. And so uh, you know we we've all seen the trends, and for those of us uh, you know who've been around uh, wind and solar for a while is that um, very quickly, uh, you know, you hit a tipping point in an industry and then suddenly uh, uh, everything starts to happen without the broader community fully understanding what exactly that means. And so in the case of wind and solar, uh, you know, I, when I was at Horizon in 2006, like, you know, we were trying to figure out, all right, well, you know, right now if Texas has 2% wind energy, like how much more can it possibly grow. And, you know, today, 15 years later, it's like 22, 23% of all generation comes from wind. Um, in the same way, there probably won't be more than five gigawatts of natural gas built in the U.S. ever again. And uh, everything at this point is moving to new wind, new solar, and pushing out coal and uh, starting to push out the inefficient peakers. And this is all happening before we're starting to have the full convergence and the electrification of power, heating, and transportation, which is just going to lead to a significant amount of energy demand. And so with that, it becomes a question of, all right, if you have a bunch of new wind, you have a bunch of new solar, what holds it all together? If you hit the next slide. Um, so really, uh, at that point, you know, we, we have the market fundamentals of a lot of intermittent renewal. Uh, intermittent renewable power um, is coming online in wind and solar. And then uh, does it make sense to use batteries to be able to uh, balance everything out? Or do you have to use natural gas? And so with me, uh, you know, I always look at uh, logarithmic um, what happens whenever you go from 1,000 units, 10,000 units to 100,000 units. And what's happening on the battery side is exactly what happened on the solar side of uh, you start to get about you know, 20% price decline 
anytime you uh, kick in another zero and, and move down the path on logarithmic scale. And so in order to really drive down the price of solar panels, like you initially needed 15 years ago, you needed Germany, you needed Ontario with their feed-in tariffs, you needed the New Jersey SREC program. And that really drove down the price of solar panels such that uh, you know only ERCOT today is really starting having the ramp up on solar. But that was because there were, you know, in the past 20, 30 years of federal subsidies, state subsidies, provincial subsidies happening elsewhere. With batteries, um, we don't have to depend on that for stationary stores, and we don't have to depend on subsidy-driven markets. Uh, instead, it's the fundamental question of uh, at what point does do these projects start to make sense? And so electric vehicles are really what's driving down the overall cost of batteries. And so really, uh, you know, California saying no more petrol, um, you know, new cars after 2035. Uh, it's Europe saying no new gasoline or diesel cars, you know, post-2030. Um, the supply chain is all coalescing. Prices go down. Uh, next slide, please. And so where that leaves us today is that, you know, the entire, uh, you know, uh, energy storage market in the U.S. is, I don't know, one or two gigs of uh, production currently in the ground. But uh, this year, it's, it's going to double, triple, quadruple, something along that. And uh, the trajectory after this just uh, goes up. And so uh, just, again, like everything, uh, all the U.S., all the battery storage projects, it's one or two gigs at this point. And um, we just need to look at California and Texas and see that that's going to, to double this year. And so there are starting to be the really marquee, uh, really big projects that are hitting. And uh, that's 300 megawatt size projects in, in California. Uh, both Steve and I are doing, you know, 100 megawatt size projects today uh, in Texas. And uh, so really at this point, like real capital is coming into the market. Uh, my company alone, you know, will be 250, 300 million in CapEx just in 2021. And, uh, you know, for, for next year, that, that just increases. And so just for the table setting, if you hit the next slide, um, it, it's, it's not just companies like mine saying that, all right, this is a thing. Um, you know, we are getting third parties and, uh, you know, uh, outside views all, all saying the same thing. And so uh, the Bank of America, um, you know, they had a storage panel last week. And, um, you know, their, their view now is that this is the quote unquote single most promising subsector. And so just as far as how we look on how the energy transition is going to happen and where, you know, the big amounts of money and the big projects are going to hit, um, you know, storage is uh, the, the obvious one today. And there's a lot of different business models and a lot of ways to take the entire industry and uh, look forward to uh, the rest of this conversation on it. Great, thanks, Jeff. Um, that, was, that was really helpful. Um, one quick housekeeping note here. If, if y'all have questions at the bottom of the screen here, there's a little Q&A button. Feel free to, uh, to type to answer or type questions in there. And we will uh, we'll have about 15 minutes at the end to, uh, to go through some of, the, uh, some of the audience questions. So to start, I'm, I'm gonna give you guys a quote here. Um, it's, it's, it's a European quote, but um, it's, it's applicable here. And, and the quote is, in order to achieve the 100 terawatt hours of annual expansion required for climate neutrality, the level of 2020 energy storage needs to be doubled. So this is all kind of confirmatory to what, to what Jeff said, and I think, um, part of the reason why we have 245 people here right now is that this is happening now, right? This is the energy transition is, is occurring now. Storage is happening. Renewable integration is happening. Um, and these are real challenges that need to be solved um, and real, real capital that needs to be deployed, real projects that need to be built. This isn't um, an idea or some 10 year down the road um, plan that, that we're talking about. Uh, so Steve, do you think you could give us a quick overview on why storage is important? Why is this sort of the critical piece to unlocking you know, greater carbon emission reductions and, and that next phase of the energy transition? Sure, happy to. I'll give it a shot. And I'm sure Jeff and Rohit can, can, uh, can complement and supplement. Um, well, I think, remember, we're in the energy business. And so the energy business is, is getting the res get, collecting the resource and delivering it the, to the customer. In a, in a reliable way. So uh, let's use the analog of molecules, either gas or oil. 
uh, inevitably there's going to be a mismatch between supply and demand. The customer, the refinery doesn't need the supply when you've got it and, and vice versa. They'll, <coughs> they'll, um, they may need it and you, you may not have it. So uh, again, storage is a natural idea. The challenge with the power sector is <laughs> really the, the, the technology and also the, I think the pace of response. Um, Power supply and demand has to balance within the second, I mean, even microsecond. Um, sure, frequency can vary, but not by too much or else uh, as, a, as a synchronized system, you have blackouts and problems. So it's, it is a much more complex technical challenge. And so the, your storage technology has to match that. Uh, where we are now, though, the interesting thing is with the increase of intermittent supply, you've got this greater exogenous variable in the real-time matching of supply and demand. So, I mean, that, that's a very technical way to, to, way to look at it as a system design. Uh, you can think of it another way. Uh, ISOs or utilities are the orchestra conductors. They're making sure that the right instruments play at the right time. And now, uh, you know, introduce a wind chime that's blowing in the wind to your orchestra. And so what do you do, what do, you do as the orchestra, orchestra conductor? How do you prepare for that? How do you plan for that? So, uh, the good news is, as Jeff was talking about, is our choices for power storage from a technical perspective are getting wider, you know, broader and cheaper. So uh, what he and I have built this year and next year are lithium ion cells, but there are plenty of other technologies that are out there. I mean, we've had pump storage, uh, pump hydro storage for years. Um, certainly there are benefits to that. It's very cheap marginal cost. Um, probably per kilowatt hour on a scale, it's, it's, it's lower. That being said, there's certainly, there's a permitting. You need, you need a, a, <laughs> a difference of an elevation and it's harder to build. So there are a lot, there's a whole range out there. Why Key Capture and Broadreach and other firms like ours have been focused on lithium ion cells is because the cost, and cost has gone down so dramatically, the performance has increased and it's incredibly modular. Modular. We can build these almost anywhere with a high voltage interconnection uh, opportunity, either a tie-in or at an existing sub, and be up and running uh, from start to finish within six months. So uh, <laughs> that is allowing a whole different, I think, dimension of how we can address uh, the, the storage challenges to make sure this real-time supply and demand matching uh, happens. So let me stop there and let's see if, uh, you know, other panelists want to add, or if, if that addressed your question, Chris? Yeah, that was that was really helpful. I, you know, one thing I'd be curious is is are you guys seeing uh, maybe maybe Jeff and Rohit, are you guys seeing a lot of um, uh, integration now between renewable development and battery development? I are are all the renewable projects now getting built with batteries? Is that in the early stages? Where is that in the in the development of of its life cycle? Start with you, Jeff. Um, yeah, so it's going to be in all of the above market. So why we concentrate in uh, standalone projects is because we can go exactly where it's needed. And so like really with us, you know, charging, discharging on the grid, um, you know, you get into closer into urban areas or on the exact spot on the grid that uh, there tends to be a lot of congestion. And uh, you can do that in a way with a standalone energy storage project that you cannot do with wind plus storage or, or solar plus storage. And so for us, like it, I mean, that, that's really the name of the game of just where exactly does the grid need, uh, you know, uh, storage in order to upgrade. Um, right now, because of federal tax policy reasons, like you are seeing a lot of solar plus storage projects, um, do they inherently make the most sense for using our existing grid in the maximum way? No. But, uh, you know, tax policy kind of drives a lot. And so uh, if the Biden administration does have a standalone, you know, storage investment tax credit by itself uh, to put us on parity with, you know, the PTC for wind or ITC for solar, um, then at that point, like you're going to be seeing a lot more different applications being used in a lot of different places. Um, one other thing that, you know, is not talked about is, uh, you know, thermal plus storage. And uh, like we're working now, you know, with a IPP to put a battery on a coal plant that's currently being decommissioned. 
Um, there's going to be a lot of applications that are going to be hitting in the future um, of, you know, using storage as a, you know, plus one, um, you know, on both existing assets, thermal and renewables, as well as new stuff. That's uh, interesting. If I can add to that now, great point, Jeff. I mean, again, think this is this is another widget in the toolbox, tool in the toolbox with really fast ramp up and ramp down rates. Um, you know, so they can complement existing thermals or turbines um, or even provide black start. So uh, absolutely right. I, I think folks need to think of the entire system. And now you've got a cheaper, uh, w another option that's very cheap and reliable and very, uh, very fast, respond fast responding. So what do you do with it? Yeah, it's interesting. The the thermal plus uh, plus battery is interesting because it it allows you to leverage existing infrastructure. And and one thing I've learned in my career is if if people hate anything more than oil pipelines, it's uh, it's high voltage transmission lines. So to the extent that you can leverage existing infrastructure, that that seems to be uh, to be to be helpful. Um, Rohit, Jeff mentioned the Biden administration. Um, can you give us your thoughts on uh, sort of what a Biden administration and now the the, the blue wave means for things like the ITC, the PTC, and sort of the, the broader um, you know, storage and renewable trends over the next call four years. Yeah, sure, Chris. Um, maybe before I do that, though, I'd like to just maybe go back to the first question you asked around solar plus storage, which I think is a really important one. Um, uh, so I think to, to, to Jeff's point and Steve's point, you know, we are seeing a lot of standalone storage. In fact, I think back in 2013 or 12 or so when, this, when storage really came on the scene, you know, it was really mostly standalone storage for a few years uh, that you know, a lot of the California utilities were procuring. And in the last just three or four years, uh, we've seen a massive wave of solar plus storage projects. You know, you have utilities all across the country, you know, the NDEs, the Excels, the, the California uh, CCAs, et cetera, um, looking for solar plus storage. Um, and it, it's a combination of, you know, price going down and also a combination of, you know, coal plant uh, retirements and, so, and, and, you know, multiple uses of storage that they're going to that calculus. Um, and I do think that, you know, going forward, uh, I think you're going to see just the same level of demand and increased demand for standalone storage. I think you're going to see a lot more solar and wind plus storage as well. In fact, I'd, I'd even venture to say that, you know, in the future, many, if not most of solar uptake arrangements will have storage in them. I think it's going to be difficult to, to necessarily see, you know, there's not going to be a lot more in the next 10, 15 years of just pure standalone solar contract. I think you're going to see a lot of them with storage. Um, and then just going to your question, the Biden administration. Yeah, I think, you know, as Jeff had mentioned, I think the possibility of, you know, now we have a technically, you know, majority Democratic uh, Congress and, and president. I, I think a standalone ITC is, storage ITC is definitely much more possible. Um, I think Biden's goal is to get down to zero uh, emissions from the electricity industry by 2035 or so, which is aggressive, but it's, you know, definitely possible. Uh, that, that, again, is going to be uh, driven by how much storage is in the ground helps to bridge the intermittency and, and help, you know, um, you know, rid of, of fossil fuels. Um, Biden also has a lot of executive powers at his, at his disposal too, right? He's canceled the Keystone Pipes Pipeline, only suspended it for now. Um, he's rejoined the Paris Accord. He wants to put out $400 billion of procurement um, uh, at the federal level of renewables and batteries, which is, which is pretty strong. And of course, he has a $2 trillion plan, right, for infrastructure and, and clean energy. So I think all of those combined, I think, is, are going to definitely push pretty well in favor of, of more storage. Got it. Um... It seems like to me in the past couple of years, the store, the energy storage industry has really hit a tipping point where five ish years ago, it was a sleepy corner, very, very small. And then in the last couple of years, it's really hit this tipping point and now it's hit that inflection point and it's on this exponential growth curve. Um, Steve, what do you think is the, was was kind of the catalyst uh, for that for that inflection? Was it a technology advancement? Was there something political, market, or, or what was the, the sure. catalyst there? Yeah, combination of factors, of course. But I would say technology is number one. Same thing we saw in wind. Same thing we saw on solar. And when I started my career in renewables, you know, <laughs> I sold my wind power to people who had to buy them, had to buy it due to RPS obligations. I mean, we were twice, if not three times, the marginal cost of energy. Now, wind's the cheapest marginal cost of energy, you know, in, in the U.S. by far. Uh, solar is number two, and just probably seven years ago, solar wasn't the case. We were installing solar projects at two dollars a watt. Now we're well below one dollar a watt. 
So uh, again, you're, this is a, it, the, again, the interesting thing, and, and I know Kay laughed when I told her this, this is old wine and new jugs. I mean, this is, we've seen this in the, this is the energy industry. I mean, what happened with natural gas with fracking, right? Then all of a sudden natural gas, uh, uh, actually an old technology got better and it produced, you know, incredible amount of reserves in the U.S., creating energy and independence in, the, in that aspect. And natural gas prices that used to be six, seven, eight bucks, a, you know, an MMBTU are now, you know, always between two and three, maybe, maybe three fifty at some point, right? So that changed the game, and so you've got game changers all across, all across the system now in power largely due to technology. And again, you know, one thing that I keep wondering is like, why lithium ion and isn't that, aren't there other technologies? Of course. And so this technology, uh, these technologies are keep, are gonna keep getting better and better and the system needs to op optimize for the right solution. The other factor then is electric vehicles. So again, why are, uh, I heard this morning that a third of all of Volvo's 2020 European sales were all electric last year. I mean, a third. I mean, this is just 20% of all European car sales last year were all electric. I mean, this is it, right. It used to be the kooky physics professor that had the all electric vehicle. Now, a third of Volvos are, are, uh, are you know, all electric. So we are way past the tipping point. Um, uh, so uh, you put those things together, you've got this monster industry of EV that's going to be funding billions of dollars of research into the technology, that's going to continue. Uh, frankly, the grid is a beneficiary of that transportation. The great, and, and then, then pull it together, right? When will this bubble stop? Well, I don't see it stopping. And now's the virtuous cycle, right? So now you got electric vehicles increasing electric demand, which is now uh, <clears throat> causing the electric system to expand, which is allowing the need for more energy from wind and solar, which is then creating the demand for the real time matching that storage has to provide. So we are really on a, on a call it a snowball or virtuous cycle, but it, it, it is the, the factors all seem to be just strengthening each other. Uh, uh, it's a real feedback loop rather than, you know, something's gonna, something's gonna stop and, and the music's gonna stop. It just seems like uh, given those fundamentals, um, probably the only risk is policy as always, right? And, and now with the, with the Biden administration, as well as even state support, those seem to be, those are supportive as well. That's helpful. And, uh, and Jeff, I want to get, get your, your thoughts on that, but I'm, I'm also curious, he mentions the EV side and as you know, you guys are putting a, a lot of capital and a lot of batteries in the ground this year. Are you finding any challenges um, on the, kind of the flip side of you got the EV industry putting lots of money into the advancement of the technology. They're also buying a lot of batteries. Is that causing any challenges for you guys on the procurement side? Yeah, so just on a macro level, like, yeah, I mean, there, there will be a battery crunch uh, 21, 22 uh, globally. And that's just because there's, there's a ton of batteries all getting snapped up by the electric vehicle industry right now. And so, uh, you know, I know with us, like we had to be really aggressive going out, uh, you know, on a procurement plan to, you know, lock up one gigawatt hour worth of batteries uh, just to make sure that we, we have them for our projects. And so uh, fundamentally, you know, it'll be the same as what happened with wind and what happened with solar uh, fits and starts um, whenever it comes to the manufacturing and uh, any sort of like long term, you know, very clear policy at the federal level that says, uh, this market will be here the next 10 years, start building, um, you know, is good. But as Steve said, um, you know, with wind and solar, it was all driven by, you know, state renewable portfolio standards. And it was driven by policy. It was driven by, you know, uh, like fighting at, at the very local level in order to uh, like get the policies in place in order to kick off the entire industry uh, versus now with standalone storage, it's, it's, it's economics. And so uh, it's, it's a very, very different world. And you have that uh, where, you know, we're now um, at parity with natural gas uh, for a four hour system versus a new peaker um, versus we have a price decline of 10% year over year versus they don't. And so really at this point, like any, you know, if you're any utility, any public utility commission, why on earth would you allow for a new natural gas plant when you clearly won't be able to recover your costs in the next 30 years? 
So it's just a very different paradigm, a very different system overall. And so uh, that's that's what really makes it, uh, you know, incredibly exciting and, and the spot to be, uh, you know, right now and the next five years. That's interesting. And I, I think that's a really important point to, to drive home to everybody is that the old world order was more policy, subsidy, tax structure driven. And now batteries, renewables are competing head to head on an economic basis. Um, and I think that that segues well into the into kind of the next area I want to talk about, which is the market and um, where are you guys seeing opportunities? What are the structures that are getting done? So, so Rohit, um, you've, you've done a lot of these deals. How have you seen the structure of the deals change over the past you know, five years and, and kind of what are investors looking for? How are people underwriting this? Who are the counterparties? So what's the, how's the deal ecosystem evolved? Sure, it's all good questions, Chris. Um, so I'd say that from an investment standpoint, we're representing a bunch of investors and sponsors doing all, all of sorts of, you know, investing in just individual projects, investing in portfolios, buying and selling them. And I'd say the investor framework is generally the same, same names you'll see, large um, infrastructure and energy sponsors and, and, and funds are doing the same sort of investments in, in storage. Um, and they're really looking for two things, right? Just like they would in any other, you know, non-recourse finance type of generation or storage project, they're looking for revenue certainty and technology, like Steve was saying before, right? On a revenue certain basis, you need some sort of revenue cert revenue certainty. You need an offtake contract that has some fixed cash flow, or you need to be able to hedge whatever merchant flows are out there, which I'm sure Steve and Jeff get into in more detail. Um, and so we've seen across the across the country now, there's been um, a range of deal structures in revenue, right? So that's the first uh, first category is revenue. The second thing you need is you need technology certainty, and that's where we've seen a big shift. You know, just a few years ago, we were doing mostly fully wrapped EPC contracts for storage, and today you have deals done at the very other end of the spectrum where you have multiple, uh, you know, multiple procurement contracts um, entered into by developers where developers take a lot more technology risk on themselves, or they're just farming out to different, uh, different uh, suppliers on different bases. Um, and I guess the one other thing I just mentioned in terms of what investments are looking for, we've all seen a lot of investors interested in stores that have good trading uh, platforms and good trading shops, because especially in places that have more energy only markets, like for instance, Texas, right? ERCOT, um, where you don't have a fixed offtake like you would, might, might have it in, in, in New York or California, you're looking for the ability to really maximize, optimize revenues through arbitrage and ancillary. So that's really all you have. Uh, so having a trading platform is pretty important as well uh, on, on that front. Yeah, Chris, if you don't mind, let me add to Rohit. I, I love his point about the supply chain and how the models are changing. I mean, we're, we're not really at Kitty Hawk, but we're probably a couple of years past Kitty Hawk at this point for this industry. And just everyone's trying trying to figure out who's going to do what and, 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 and experimenting with bundled contracts or disaggregated contracts and developing software on their own or buying a, buying a shop. So this is going to continue to mix and match. The great news is again, you know, put this to, to push the metaphor, it, you know, instead of looking back, Oh, geez, there's a lot of uh, 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 confusion. Look forward, look, you know, think about the passenger air miles coming up, right? I mean, there is so much potential here for these things. There's, there's going to be a combination of suppliers and models and contracts and investors, and some will be merchant and some will be contracted, and there's going to be synthetic contracts, you know, and Kay, to bring it back to, to your group, the great news is, you know, if you think about the one city in the nation that has all this talent that's very used to these sort of skills and putting it together, it's Houston. Uh, where else have you done this? Well, we've done this for, for decades in power, gas, and oil, just using using a really different vocabulary. And, and Jeff, I'd love you to, to answer that as well and, and also um, talk a little bit about kind of geographically, right? When, when, um, you know, when oil and gas people talk about energy storage, they always talk about the globe, right? Well, in, in China, it's like this, but, you know, we're focused here on the US and the markets are extremely different. And so where are you guys focused and, and why are you focused in those various markets here domestically? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I clearly watch what, what all my competition is doing. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're all approaching the markets very different. 
So, uh, you know, with us as a company, like we always, you know, aim to be where the market's going to be in three to five years uh, so that we, we don't have much competition. And so uh, for us, you know, we in 2017, uh, you know, the market fundamentals of Texas were like, all right, something's here. And, uh, you know, then we were able to sign up a bunch of contracts and, uh, you know, do do large stage development. And uh, it's always a lot easier to sign up bilateral deals um, after there is, uh, you know, a extreme event in the market. And so after August of 2019, when, uh, you know, a lot of people lost a lot of money because power price in Texas went absolutely sky high, um, you know, there, there were a lot of deals to be made. And so uh, for us, like, you know, we went big in, you know, 2018, 2019, signing up contracts here. And, you know, we're building this day in 21 and 22. Um, now, uh, you know, we're fundamentally in the market fundamentals in New York, uh, we find very bullish. And so hence, we've been developing projects there the last three years, and that'll be our growth in 22, 23. And then uh, we're, we're, we're still incredibly bullish New England. Um, you know, we, we just need some more wholesale market access. And so for us as a company, Texas, New York, New England, and, you know, it tends to be a trajectory just as far as the geographic diversity. But, um, you know, Steve's in California. There's a huge market there. Uh, the entire desert southwest, Arizona, Nevada, it's, it's a very clear, very well understood market. Um, and then we're going to be seeing some really, really weird, uh, you know, markets starting to emerge. And they could be ones that are legislatively driven, um, such as in New Jersey or Virginia, or, uh, you know, they could be markets that uh, pop up organically, or they could be markets in vertically integrated states where, again, a public utility commission, why on earth would you approve a new natural gas plant ever again? And so, uh, yeah, it's going to be hitting in different spots, and there will be a lot of different business models, different types, and uh, hopefully a lot of winners coming out of this. Yeah. And, and how do you guys see the the kind of revenue profiles uh, on these on these projects? Are you more on on a merchant on a kind of standalone merchant project? Are you more trying to capture ancillary service revenue? Are you more weighted towards the peak capture? Is it some combination of both? How does that kind of break out in in, in your mind, Jeff? And then we'll go to Steve after that. Yeah, so this is how storage IPPs are so different than the wind and solar projects of 10, 12 years ago. And uh, like if you were a wind IPP, um, you know, you're selling a 20 year increment to the electron, you are doing it in markets with renewable portfolio standards, and you know, you're competing against how windy is your site, how low cost is your interconnection, do you have wind turbines, um, and what's your cost of capital? Uh, compare that to us, where uh, basically, there's going to be a merchant component of uh, most of these. Um, you know, we have synthetic financial fixed for floating contracts that uh, give us revenue certainty. But around that, you, you have to schedule your battery day ahead real time market and figure out where exactly, how exactly you should be, um, you know, scheduling your battery. And so this is this is the part I didn't understand four years ago when I started this of just um, how incredibly important it is for those algorithms. And so, uh, you know, we, out of 45 people, we have eight folks at Pergamon and Python. Um, you know, we have a former PGM FDR trader. We have the former EDPR, you know, asset optimization uh, lead on our team. And so really it's uh, scheduling the battery in the day ahead market um, in order to be able to get, you know, the, the best revenue. Um, that, that's actually really tough. And in those algorithms and, you know, how it's driven, um, that, that's a ton of work and, you know, is a secret sauce of storage IPPs. Yeah, let me jump in, Chris. Um, I think what you need to appreciate is a storage asset is a, capa is a capacity product. That, that's really what you're bringing to the grid. Um, solar and wind are, are mostly energy. You know, they'll provide kilowatt hours. But what a storage asset can do when it's very, most valuable is providing capacity either as gen or load. So on those price spikes, when you need more energy, you're, a, you, you can supply that quickly and then take that to the, to the microsecond uh, you know, for frequency response or ancillaries. But really the, the point here is you've got capacity where it's where it's needed so that's the mobility and modularity part of it and when it's needed the 
the contrast for the gas turbine is the, is the load side, right? You can take energy off the system uh, when and where it's needed. And that's, I think, the different appeal, the batteries to, I would say, peakers that, that, that provide more value. Uh, that, that's a long intro to answer your question, Chris. I think your contract structure then and your value will reflect where at that node is most valuable. Is it about energy shifting? So not within the minute, but within the day or, or across the day. Is that where the capacity is needed? Or is it, is, is it needed more on that minute by minute or within the hour? And so then <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll either contract or not, but certainly the, 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 the flip side, the people who are exposed to that risk, um, they'll want to contract with your asset. And, and so Chris, you know, maybe putting another way, I view the business as a risk management business. I mean, so in any energy system, you've got, Ultimately, the distributor is selling to customers and they want energy at a fixed price, at a fixed you know, uh, uh, forecasted price. And that's what they're paying you for. They're paying you for you to manage the financial risks and the physical risks. But for the power grid, that's typically done by the ISO. But there, when, when you're signing a contract with your rep or your utility and your co-op, what you're really asking them to do is manage the financial risks. And so... What storage can now do is add another risk management service to the financial to the financial system here. That's uh, maybe a different different source of products because it is more flexible and certainly at a lower cost than the traditional providers of this, which are mostly gas turbines. So we're gonna. I've been giving you guys all the all the good stuff. And we've been talking about all the great things um, in the storage side. I want to, I want to turn around a little bit and talk about some of the challenges to the scaling up of the, of the energy storage um, uh, space. Let's start with Rohit. What, what are the key challenges that you've seen um, in kind of getting battery deals done, um, you know, integrating these assets into existing grids, where have been the big hangups or, or challenges that you've seen on, on either investor side or industry side? Yeah, good question, Chris. Um, so there's been a few different challenges. I think it also depends on what, what market you're in. Going back for a second to Steve's point around, you know, the capacity product, right? I think the deal structures we've seen really do, do really vary based on what market you're in. So, you know, in kind of a contrast to the kind of energy markets we're talking about where you have arbitrage and ancillary uh, value out of the storage, we're doing a bunch of uh, you know long-term 10, 15 year fixed uh, fixed payment contracts in California, in New York, in Colorado, uh, you know Virginia. There's been six, seven states where we're doing them in, right? Even I even almost almost signed one up in Texas, you know, for a small municipal a few years ago, a couple years ago. So um, you do see that contrast where you do have long-term fixed revenue contracts. Um, and so let's let's draw let, let's categorize or categorize the risks risks in terms of uh, on a revenue basis, right? Where you have fixed revenue contracts, the risks are largely, in my mind, the ones we already talked about, which is technology, get past that. And then you go to things like change of law risk, right? Change of law risk is, has in some jurisdictions have become one of the biggest single issues in these contracts in the last couple of years, um, especially where, where the batteries providing capacity products. So for instance, in California, where batteries are providing RA or resource adequacy, um, as some of some people in the industry know, the, the, you know, the calculation of RA or capacity value is changing, is not certain yet on, on, on storage, both on standalone basis and also on a hybrid basis when paired with solar. And so that, that single issue, you know, we did seven or eight of these contracts last year um, across a couple of, of large off-takers in California and served as the biggest, you know, hang up in those contracts. Um, and, you know, th that same type of change in law risk also extends to other markets like New York and other places we're doing as well. Uh, so that, that's been, you know, one of the main kind of issues or, or challenges in the, in, in the industry I've seen. Got it. And, and Jeff, uh, from from the developer's perspective, where you know, what keeps you up at night and uh, and, and makes you uh, makes you worried about the next the next year or two? Well, what are your biggest challenges? Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, it depends on the week. On huh? what wakes me up, it's always at two twenty in the morning. Uh, for some reason, you know, the the morning wake up calls are at no other time, but it's two twenty a.m. that you know typically the things are running through the head. Um, you know, it, it's the scaling up of an industry, like all of us are figuring this out together. And so, um, you know, I remember when I was at Horizon down in Houston back in 2006, and, uh, you know, at that point we had 300 megawatts online collectively. 
and you know you get told from you know your suppliers that we're we're currently at a 97% availability rate and then uh, we started to bring on our team and bring on the asset management and uh, you know start to do our own analysis and actually it's it's not 97% availability but it's really 90 and um and so uh you know and then you start to go and just be like all right well here's preventative maintenance here's you know weird things that could happen etc and so the entire industry we're all doing that right now and so um you know what what just keeps me up uh you know is just figuring out um how to be able to fully operate these you know in the safest manner possible um you know with uh the right view because um there's not that that many data points out there in the market and yeah like going back to you know what what steve was saying earlier too just as far as um you know how the different markets are evolving and um we we all get uh access to the markets in different ways and you know that's all based upon rto rules and uh you don't actually know a lot of the times before you put a project on how you can actually uh be able to schedule the project in, in, in real time. Like in, in the case of Texas, uh, managing your state of charge today is actually really, really hard. And, you know, there's a regulatory change in April or May, but like we, we don't know. Or in the case of our projects in New York, um, you know, we uh, are, are putting online a 200 megawatt project at the end of 2022. And um, the energy storage resource, the ESR construct, nobody's actually done before. And so hence we have to put on a 20 megawatt project this year that's marginal, um, you know, as far as returns go, just because fundamentally uh, I, I don't feel confident doing a 200 megawatt project once I have some data how batteries work. And so, uh, yeah, what keeps me up is, you know, that, that intersection of just, we don't know what unknown unknowns are fully in the market yet. And, and that just, unfortunately, just comes from time. Yeah, Steve, same question. What, yeah. uh, what's well, the blind spot here? Let me riff off that. I, you know, it, it's, I can't imagine any, any sort of investment where you're investing hundreds of millions, billions of dollars without risk, right? So I, I think the challenge is out of leadership and vision. Um, let me put it another way. For those who think, oh, this is uh, just like solar, so where's my 15 year bus bar PPA and uh, ITC and I know how to finance this. Um, so it's not, it's not that. And if, if that's what you're looking for, this isn't your investment. But, but more importantly is Jeff, we are figuring this out, but let me go back to the metaphor about you know, Kitty Hawk. You've got to think, where is this going? And so that to me is, is have take the take the far sighted vision, but it's it's not even that far. We're just asking a few years from now uh, how this is going to work out. But let me put it this way: the the risk to storage is that the power markets get boring, that that the prices don't change, load patterns doesn't change, and oh by the way, wind and solar patterns don't change either. That's if if you're betting against the need for storage, that's what your that's your vision is that nothing's gonna change over the next 10 years. If you, the bullish case for storage, and it, you don't even have to be that, you just need to believe one of them, is that gigawatts of wind and solar are gonna be added to the grid. Load is going to increase and is going to, the patterns are gonna change as the market changes and as the cost of electricity decreases and as new technology gets developed. And, and, and again, and from the, from the supply side is um, the cost of the choices for your kit are going to get better and cheaper. So you've got to believe none of those things are going to happen if you think this is not going to be a good investment. So that, that to me is, is, I guess, my appeal to folks is it, it, just, just take a look of where this is going and, and project ahead and think about how good this could be, this system, if it really starts, if we really start putting our, our investment dollars and our heads and our energy into it. And of course, all the young people now are looking to, to join the energy transition and add their talent and energy to it. We, we can do this and, and it's going to be growing at the projections we've seen, but think about the end result. It, 
the end result is a cleaner, cheaper, more reliable grid that keep, keeps getting cleaner, cheaper, and more reliable. And so that, that is really something to keep working on. Which brings me back to the leadership. So if you're a leader in a bank or an investment firm or a law firm or anything, and you're deciding which group do I beef up over the next year, if you don't invest more in the energy transition, what you're saying is, I don't think those things are going to happen. And I'd rather spend my time in some other sector. It just seems you put that all together. This isn't, this isn't even, you know, not just a safe bet, it's a smart bet. This, this is a growing industry with some great fundamentals. So I think that's, that's the appeal is for the leaders, especially in the policy to, to think about, if you're worried about jobs, think about the jobs that are gonna be created with a cleaner, cheaper, reliable grid. Think, think about the manufacturing opportunities, the domestic manufacturing opportunities that we're starting to see in Texas, where, where you've got this push for uh, renewable energy that's cheap and reliable. I mean, we're starting to see it and it's not that hard to believe. That, that's where the jobs are going to come. And that's, that's where the real economic development engine is going to be. We've, we've got about 10 minutes left here. And, and uh, one of the most popular comments as I scroll through the, the group questions here is, is about technology. And I know Jeff has a, has a very uh, uh, strong opinion on, on some of these various technologies. So, so Jeff, can you talk for a few minutes about Lithium ion, the other storage technologies. We have a couple of questions in here about hydrogen. Does that work? At what time? What about K's? What about these other things? Um, and go for it. Take it away. I, I love your answer to this. Yeah. Um, so, as a developer, um, I, I I'm technology agnostic. So fundamentally, whatever is going to be the best return is going to be um, you know what what we ultimately wind up building. Um, however, in 2007 or so, I remember, uh, you know, I was running all the financial models for Horizon at that point, and, uh, you know, solar thermal was the clear winner compared to solar photovoltaic. And uh, over the past 15 years, uh, that clearly didn't work. And that didn't work just because uh, you had the global headwinds and, uh, you know, the continuous learning um, as you continue photovoltaic. And so like the photovoltaic uh, chemistry at this point, not the best, quite frankly, like there's new stuff coming out all the time in academic journals, but you literally have to be two or three times better um, as far as a new technology in order to be able to uh, be able to beat that cost curve. Like whenever you have our 10% year over year price decline, like you, you have to be two times better in order to uh, get commercialized and, and make a dent. And so, uh, I'm not bullish any other technology at this point besides lithium ion. I'm seeing nothing on the next three to five years that uh, you know I can get uh, debt financing on. Uh, with that said, like there are you know stuff in pilot projects for the really long duration storage. Um, you know that that could be two or three times better, but um, it's not commercialized yet. And then for the super long stuff, the hydrogen, uh, you know, technologies of the world and what have you, there's a lot of money going into it. But uh, right now, the wholesale markets don't don't support any of those projects. And so it just becomes a question fundamentally of what's the tipping point on all these technologies. Got it. So with the last the last few minutes here, um, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this industry, what we need. Steve, you 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 mentioned this at the end of yours. You know, there's a lot of a lot of young folks on here who are enthusiastic and want to get involved. What skill sets do you guys need? What where are the holes in this industry? What are the what are the skills that are going to be useful? Kind of question one and two. As this is a, a Houston-based group, um, can you guys talk a little bit about uh, Stephen and, and Jeff in particular why you've chosen to to put part of your business here and, and grow your business in Houston? Sure, I'll start. So, um, you know, for folks interested, you know, follow uh, Kay's group, right, and and see where it goes because it's going to be the the real network, the hub of I think renewables in, in Houston. And, and there's always been a Houston, you know, renewables group, but and, and now we have uh, uh, probably a you know a roof to, to to point to. So it's been more informal. So, but why Houston? Well, I, to me, it comes back to this is the energy business, and so. Uh, the skills taking the resource to the customer in a fixed price way, all, all the jobs that are uh, uh, associated with that from getting the resource 
the civil engineers, the uh, electrical engineers, the contractors, uh, certainly all the attorneys and uh, investors and bankers and financial analysts, as well as the schedulers, the 24 ops um, and the IT folks that understand that and NERC compliance and, and ERCOT compliance and the whole, the whole list from, you know, molecule to the electrical outlet or, you know, from the point, um, those have all been tried and true in, in Houston. So right there is a fantastic deep skill set. Um, that you can tap into. Uh, I would just ask, or uh, my advice to younger people who are interested in renewable energy or the energy transition in general is, you know, we to do this is going to take an army. I mean, you know, armies um, to to tackle this this challenge. It's going to be trillions of dollars, and it's going to take decades. So, in my advice to anyone is think what role you want to play. Do you want to be uh, on the engineering side? There's lots of white collar. There are more traditional, um, you know, in the field service jobs. Um, you know, 20 years ago, there wasn't. No one knew what a wind tech was, and now wind tech is a great is a great uh, job and is growing as well. Like one of the fastest growing. There's solar installers. We're going to need battery technicians. We're going to be battery testers. We're going to need uh, battery contractors. We're going to need. Um, advocates, we're going to need state legislative advocates, federal advocates, I mean, you name it, but we are growing billions of dollars a year. So think about all the opportunities that that presents and, and, you know, throw your hat in, join a group and just, you know, hang on, it's going to be a lot of growth. Yeah, Jeff, uh, same, same question to you. Yeah, so I joined Horizon Wind when there were 43 people. And, uh, you know, that was, um, like since then the, you know, Michael Skelling inspired, um, <laughs> diaspora from, from that time, uh, we recently looked up to see, you know, how many CEOs, COOs, CFOs, uh, you know, came out of that. And out of the 45 of us at that time, I think there are 15 people, uh, currently leading clean energy companies and, and different aspects. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, fundamentally, you, you always want to, early in your career, uh, you know, grab into a rocket ship and go, because it just opens up the opportunities. And uh, like, here's, you know, clearly a, a really fascinating place in the market. And, you know, some of us will be right, some will be wrong. Um, but in general, I, I think we're going to be more right. Um, you know, Houston, it was built on, uh, like, basically... Um, <laughs> 100 million barrels of oil a day globally and uh you know for oil to move up or down you know two million barrels a day in supplier demand uh like really changed between the floor price of 40 and the ceiling price of 120. uh today uh oil ain't recovering and you know as the electric vehicles take off like suddenly like now we're in you know race to the bottom on price and you know there will be natural floors and ceilings but now it'll be between like 60 and, and, you know, whatever negative price, you know, West Texas went, uh, you know, back in March. And so, uh, so like really it's just the entire Houston ecosystem and, and job network is, is changing very, very rapidly. And as everything moves over uh, and becomes electrified, uh, vehicles, heating, obviously power, um, this is a really fascinating place to be. And, and Houston has all the right components for it. So uh, yeah, I, I think Houston is going to be, you know, a dominant player going forward. Great, and uh, and Rohit, you can uh, you can finish us off here, and then and we'll we'll wrap it up. Um, probably my biggest piece of advice is go to business school, not law school. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, that's a good one. <laughs> you both go to both. Go to both. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's, uh, it's been a real honor to, to speak on this panel with you guys. Um, appreciate everybody's participation. Uh, this afternoon. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, Kay, I'll hand it over to you and, and let us know um, if you need anything else. I'm sure Kay, Kay will post all of our contact information. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much. What a great panel today. If you're not already following Key Capture and Broadreach, follow them. And I want to also throw in these two CEOs, they're walking the walk on diversity and inclusion. So check out their leadership teams and you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, thank you to our sponsors who made this possible, Sonova, Pattern, EDF, Wilkie Farr, HBW, and Baker Hostetler will be, will be announcing some new ones here soon. 
if you work for a renewable energy company or another company in the energy transition and you didn't hear your company's name, go ask your bosses. Um, so what the heck is up with that? Um, but we, we really appreciate it. Uh, we will have a, a video replay of this available and um, hope you guys will join us for other programs. And once again, thanks. Thank you to our panelists.